It's ad break time. I'm proud to announce that the Beyond Solitaire podcast is sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. 500-Year-Old Vampire, Jason Cox's cooperative role-playing game, is now shipping. And even better, there is a Halloween sale for orders placed before the end of the month. CLGS also continues to offer classes in partnership with Gen Con, and the next one starts today, October 14th. Veteran instructor Aloy Lasanta will be teaching When Worlds Meet Mechanics, Turning Fiction into Games. It's going to be a great class, and there may still be time to sign up, so check it out. Also, if you want to support this podcast, please visit patreon.com slash beyond solitaire and help me keep the lights on. But for now, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and this week on the pod, I have a very special guest, uh, Zoe Allred. Uh, it is a game designer who designs interesting semi-cooperative games and games that I would say are non-traditional in terms of their parameters, and I really want to explore that today. How are you doing, Zoe? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you on. So for people who might not know your work, uh, what are some board games that you would like people to know you for? So they can go look them up. Oh, um, well, the one I'm most known for is Persuasion. Um, that's my relationship game um, inspired by Pride and Prejudice, where you're um, sending letters to each other and trying to figure out who to marry and um, maybe catfishing somebody. Um, and another game that's... Um, um, might be self-publishing soon is a game called Bread, where you're building uh, an engine for sustenance in a famine that where there might not be enough bread for everyone. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, I want to play Tessa now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of want to start from the very beginning. So you've mentioned in a couple of your YouTube shorts and stuff that you were initially more interested in video games than in board yeah, games. That's true. So, yeah. What was your past with video games like and what kind of led to that shift? Well, um, I've been playing video games for like a very long time, like ever since I was like uh, three years old. Um, my parents got me on it as a way of building confidence because I wasn't talking. Um, but I was just very into indie games and I um, and I just think that the games as an art form was like very appealing to me. And I feel like uh, indie video games kind of hit uh, like that stuff like more publicly first um and so that's where a lot of my attention was captured and where I thought I would have to go if I was to start making games and it wasn't really till like I started um um uh, playing um like Root that I started seeing like the storytelling like capacity of like board games like I know TTRPGs are very great for that but like um I, I, I craved something a little bit more structured and I saw that in Root and I was like, wait, I could, um, my experience would actually work really well on this platform, uh, in this medium and and things kind of spiraled from there. That's awesome. Did you work on any video games before becoming a board game designer or? I, I have worked on a couple of prototypes that like I play tested like a tiny bit, but like it's so hard to iterate on video games. Um, it's, and also, it's just, yeah, it's just a lot of work. There's so much that has to go into making, like, even just a bare bones prototype functional. And then you test it, and it's like, well, I got to overhaul a bunch of stuff, and that takes so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also really interested. So you mentioned that um you liked Root because of its structure. Like, I will admit that I see the potential TTRPGs, but I also have a really hard time committing to them because I feel like it requires vulnerability of me and creativity from me that I don't necessarily want to express on the fly. Yeah, yeah. I so I I don't I I love TTRPGs, don't get me wrong, but like I feel like there's something very different from like um a game like a TTRPG like asking you directly to explore like certain topics emotionally and narratively like with your imagination and a game sort of I don't know tricking you into that with like a structured like <laughs> framework of like mechanics where it's like okay well I'm moving these bits and bobs but um suddenly I find myself having to make decisions that are narratively like heavy 
All right, perfect. So this is actually just where I was hoping we would go. We got we got <laughs> went right away. Perfect. Um, so you know, I guess that makes me want to ask then. So what is it about the structure of games that you find that you like to manipulate to get people to go in a certain place? I I think hmm. I, I think the thing that is most interesting to play with are like victory conditions um, because like uh, lots of the designers have talked about how like the uh, like how you win is like um, like is more important than like the actual winning or something like that and um, and I very much believe in that but I feel like in that vein single victory games are like incredibly narrow in that respect in that it, it's almost always like a contest of like comparative strength or um comparative domination and um even if like narratively the game is saying that you're doing some collaborative effort like it, if it's a single victor game then it's telling a very narrow story of like of like triumph of like a single person and then if it's a cooperative game it's a similarly narrow like story of like a collaborative effort succeeding or failing so when you start playing with like the victory conditions that are like kind of like between that space that's about like where it's more malleable of like like um I could win but that's an independent thing from you winning then you start getting into like storytelling spaces of like like I I have everything I need from the get-go so do I spend the rest of this time securing my like self and ensuring that I have a very solid future or do I spend that this opportunity to help like the other players also win like there's like suddenly more like social space to explore with that because like in the single victory game it's like you're in the lead and it's like well you're just going to keep getting in the lead like you're not going to help somebody else get in the lead <laughs> so am i making sense yeah and it also leads to so how do you do that in a way i guess that helps a game stay compelling and that incentivizes players in the right way because i kind of feel like you choose a victory condition and then you design the whole game around what it is that you're trying to get players to do and so you set a goal and then you work backwards from it and everything in the game is dependent on that goal so like without that kind of through line in a game design what do you do <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's tricky because it's like important that you give like clear goals and motivations to the players um, because then they might just like they don't, don't have trouble engaging if you're just sort of like here's a system um, to go do whatever in it like uh, surprisingly people are pretty good at figuring out how to do stuff in those kind of environments but I don't feel like it tells us a compelling uh, story if there's um, a lack of clear like motivations that you're providing on like a narrative level um so um so to keep that tension you 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 do want like i like this is why like i um drawn towards like these situations that are still have like a lot of conflict like i'm not like compelled to work on games that are just about like collaborative efforts like because um like projects where everybody wants the same thing and is able to win together is not as interesting to me as like projects where like multiple people want things that are in some way conflicting with each other and there's potential for collaboration but there's also like potential for people to just go their own ways and only one person is to see so um i like situations where like your victory is maybe a little fragile like um i think a a common thing that a common problem I have with playtesting is that um, people are used to games where once you achieve your your win state, the game ends. So a lot of times people will be playtesting my games and they're like, okay, I have the bread. So the game ends now, right? And it's like, no, you actually have to survive the entire famine event. You can't just, uh, um, you, you have to be able to keep that bread the whole time. And, uh, and then people sort of realize, oh, well, this is actually incredibly fragile because other people could take that bread from me. <laughs> um so those are the kind of situations that i think are like make for a tense like experience where it's like it's multi-victor and that everybody could win but like while you're in a winning state and the game timer is still ticking down it's possible for that game state to change really fast and for somebody to like upset your like stable your like um your cozy situation <laughs> <laughs> all right so like let's talk about bread since that was just brought up as an example how exactly does that game work in its current form? 
so in that game, you you're building like infrastructure and that infrastructure is either trucks for like exploring and gathering resources, uh, factories for building more infrastructure, um, and then bakeries, which is how you like quell your unrest, which is like the thing that every like player needs. Um, there's also some like weird infrastructure. It's, it's like in the same, uh, category but it's it's a little bit weird it's there's uh, unrest which is like the thing that you need to remove from your like your base in order to survive the famine and then there's walls which make it harder to interact with the other players so in that game you're you're kind of um like uh, using your truck to gather cards from the main deck And as you gather from that deck, you uncover more unrest that has to get played to other people. So more and more unrest comes up as you're playing through the game. And near the bottom of the deck, there's like a cataclysm that triggers the end of the game. So the game is like trying to find bread and build it and try to hold on to it for um, long enough that you're able to quell your unrest. And, um, and yeah, so there's an impulse that a lot of play players have to... kind of play it like because like uh uh it doesn't really look like a forex game but a lot of the like actions are kind of in that similar vein of like exploring expanding exploiting um there's not really exterminating um but uh, in a systemic sense there is <laughs> um so uh there's an impulse to sort of follow that same tradition of like They find this stuff to build an efficient engine to become more powerful and um and and then uh secure your victory condition near at in the very end. But in doing that, you're likely to have um but in like centralizing all of your resources individually, you kind of have an inefficient engine and that ends up kind of accelerating the game end state. And so the like actual optimal strategy is to like collaborate with the other players and like specialize and and kind of make very vulnerable decisions where instead of delivering goods to yourself, you're delivering goods to somebody else and hoping they follow through and deliver it back to you. <laughs> So I take it it is possible within the game for everyone to win and to have enough. Yes, it was very important to me that I mapped out that Like no matter like, uh, on the with the exception of some very specific like, um, deck structure randomness, like everybody would be able to win. So there's like a small chance that you would not be able to win, um. But it requires like extremely calculated decisions and doing things that you would not normally want to do in the engine builder, like. sacrifice part of your engine so somebody else could have a slightly more efficient turn. Oh, that's really interesting. So if players, <laughs> do players know going in that they could all win? yeah, yeah. The Or at least the game tells them that they should, in theory, be able to all win. So you tell them that up front, does that, how does that influence their behavior? Do you find that players do actually try to cooperate or do people find themselves getting greedy, even though they know perfectly well they don't have to? Well, when I first started um, testing the game, I was less upfront about that, and people would play very selfishly. But as I've been doing unguided tests where that is stated clearly up front, I'd say that the percentage of people that play collaboratively has increased significantly, and I've actually had to balance the game a bit for that. Oh, that's really interesting, but it's not guaranteed. Like, I guess it seems to me, maybe I'm just a care bear, but I'm just like, oh yeah, I mean, obviously if we can all win, we should all be trying to help each other, right? Like, that seems Yeah, so yeah. obvious. Then I look around at like the news or whatever. I'm like, wait, maybe that's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like maybe three people in your group are playing collaboratively, but maybe one person is like, well, that seems stupid. I'm going to make sure I have bread and I'm going to take from you to make sure that I secure bread. And that one person is enough to kind of throw a wrench in everybody. And then all of a sudden you have this additional problem that you have to account for. Like, do we build walls on them? Do we do we try to disarm them by giving them bread even though they're playing selfishly like um creates so yeah Oh God. Um, what about watching playtests of this game has 
surprised you or maybe just not surprised you? But like, what do you, what have you learned about human behavior from, from observing them play your game? Um, I, I really love watching playtests because like sometimes things will come up in conversation where like somebody will be like, wow, this game is really mean. And then somebody else will be like, um, I, 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 I have been able to play without being mean a lick. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I think you are choosy to be mean. <laughs> so and, people are choosing violence. <laughs> oh, like, like people, people like project stuff onto the game. Like, like, like this, it seems like, like I'll, because like a lot, I usually, I play test with a lot of designers. So sometimes the designer will be like, I think you've made like this game that's like kind of in the middle. And I think you should just make it fully cooperative. And like, or are people who are like, like, like I thought we were all going to be doing a cooperative thing, but in the end it's like, it's actually really competitive. I think it should be a competitive single player game, <laughs> single victor game. And it's like, uh, but the fuzziness between those two is what I think is most interesting, but like people kind of, project like oh I think this is supposed to be a competitive experience and therefore and the tools that this game gives me are extremely like like aggressive and like uh and hostile and so um this game is hostile but it's like the game also gives you tools to help somebody at no benefit of yourself and so it's like it's it's open-ended enough that people find things in it and project that onto the game as and saying that the game is like this but it's really there like this <laughs> okay that's actually that's a very interesting way to think about this so you know um i feel like a lot of game designers put their work into the world and kind of hope somebody will see them and kind of understand what they're trying to say through their work do you feel that your work gets misread or do you deliberately enjoy like watching other people's different readings I enjoy watching the people's different readings. Um, I'm reluctant to talk about this, but like um, Dan Thro, uh, may they uh, like analyze my game persuasion, and um, he saw it that it was like an extremely like toxic kind of relationship game, and um, and I thought that was fascinating because like I have like. I have like kind of borderline toxic or like I'm aromantic and I found myself pushed into like relationships and so I have like a very like jaded like negative view of relationships and so part of me was wondering like was that shining through is that like what was getting picked up because like in the end I kind of wanted it to be a game that was like about like like showing people that like how important being vulnerable was towards making relationships work so when he's when he released that review about how it was so beautifully toxic, I was like, was that, is that me? Did I, did I do that on purpose? <laughs> but now that we've had that conversation, I'm like, well, is it though? Because now yeah, I want to yeah. see if the game can be played like almost sweetly. Yeah. Well, like, because While like everybody's most of the time, most of the time when I played Persuasion, like, like almost everybody except for one or two people end up winning. Um, so like, uh, I can't I can't remember if he said in that review how like how it played out, but I I vaguely remember the review saying that like like very like only a couple people would end up winning his games. And I was like, how are his games playing out so differently from way I've seen them play out? And thinking that was like really fascinating. No, that actually is extremely fascinating. <laughs> um and i kind of want to bring in another kind of concept you talk about a lot on on your channel and in your shorts so you mentioned that you kind of reject victory conditions you also really like to talk about non-hierarchical games what exactly does that mean and then how does that play out in your work so when i say non-hierarchical i mean that like in a lot of ways games kind of uh, are structured in a way to imply that there's like that there is a like best outcome or best best like um best way to play um and that's where the metrics and the critiques of single victor stuff all comes into play that like that the player who played the most correctly is the one that amassed the most points more than everybody else and um in that way it's like a hierarchy like that player played better than everyone else they deserve to be ranked higher so um 
when I'm like pushing the idea of non-hierarchical games, like these horizontally structured games, they're games where you, it's about like achieving like, like a goal perhaps like, and sometimes people will like get like, uh, what's the word, uh, pedantic about this where it's like, well, if you're saying that there's like an individual goal, you're saying that there's like a better or worse thing. And it's like a binary, like hierarchy and like I, I guess if you want to fiddle with it that way but the idea is not so much that like that's um these people who achieve their goal are better than the people who didn't achieve their goal is the the emphasis is that everybody is able to achieve their goal and that there isn't one person who somehow achieved it better than everybody else it's just about giving everybody the opportunity to like thrive and not placing a judgment of like who thrived better um so I guess that's what I mean when I say like a non-hierarchical game. Um, and then, yeah, my video talks about how there's even ways to like deconstruct that. <laughs> As there should be. <laughs> um, so I guess when we talk about wanting to like prioritize non-hierarchical work and work without victory conditions, how does that play in with the games that you personally like to play? Like you've mentioned that you enjoy a lot of Cole Worley's work but mm -hmm. Cole likes really intensely competitive kind of nasty yeah. games mm -hmm. and like that is his bread and butter in terms of what he likes to play and what he likes to make so how do you I guess reconcile what you enjoy playing uh with what you enjoy making well um the way I see it is that if there were more multi-victory games I would enjoy playing them <laughs> like <laughs> um <laughs> like there's um when um Oh my God, I'm blanking on his name. Jamie, um, it invited me onto um his channel. Um, we were talking about some of our favorite multi-victor games, and at first it was like a struggle for me because I was like, "Wow, well, how many are there?" Um, and then like, and then the and then like as we we're <clears throat> as I was brainstorming with my community, and he was like sending me suggestions. It was like, okay, there actually are a few. Like, um, like uh, Fog of Love is one that's like. <clears throat> that I like really a lot it's just kind of awkward to play with people <laughs> it's a little more of a TTRPG kind of thing but he also introduced this game called We're Doomed to me which um I really like it's a it's like a through and through multi-victor game where people are potentially like where there's a lot of prisoner dilemma stuff where everybody could be working towards making more seats for everybody but also, people are kind of backstabbing each other to make sure they get the first seat and stuff like that. And so, like, and I really like that game, but a lot of my friends thought it was just okay. So I thought that was curious. But I, I think that if there were more multi-victor games, then I would, like, enjoy playing them more. But I guess that doesn't really mean that I don't, I don't enjoy the competitive games sometimes. Like... Um yeah, some I, I I like the games that are like incredibly socially like that really center that social conflict and co war these games are incredibly like like socially like uh has a lot of social friction in them. <laughs> and <laughs> I like exploring those dynamics, I guess. Yeah, I guess kind of push the other end of things. It also sounds like you don't necessarily love purely cooperative games. I mean, you know, in terms of what you make, not in terms of what you play. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I that one is like something that like I feel like I need to do some like I feel like I need to like do some soul searching to figure out exactly why that is. But um there was a um there was a sit down and shut up video recently that was like saying something about how like cooperative games are like coercive in a way in that you're it they're they're forcing you all to work together the the base assumption is that there is no conflict between you and the other players um and like there actually are a lot of cooperative games that I do enjoy but they're the ones that like forcibly insert a layer of social friction, usually like communication restrictions or things like that. And those are the games that I really love where you're trying to navigate this like like communication like problem together. And 
So those are the ones I really love. Like Space Team is one of my favorite games. And that's a game that's just chaotic, trying to solve a problem in a short time frame and with lots of like social wrenches being thrown into the mix. So there are a lot of cooperative games I like. It's just a specific type that I like, I guess. No, that makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> uh, and so just to kind of go to one thing that you also said on your channel, I thought was super interesting. Uh, you mentioned that you felt that very specific victory conditions were patriarchal. Yes. <laughs> so uh, could you elaborate on that? And like, was it a great troll? Do you mean it? Is it somewhere in the middle? I, I'm, okay. I just kind of want to pursue. All right. This is, look, like... I don't know how to say this, but like gender is like a social construct, right? Like, so yeah. like in the sense it's, it's all vibes. And so the vibes of patriarchy is that is like domination. Um, and at least to me, it's like the sense that I get from patriarchy is like, like tough men proving they're the strongest and like, like, um, and like contests of strength, um, be like being at the competition and stuff like that. So when I look at like, and another reason I think this is that there was like this, um, I've watched a few videos about like girl games, like in terms of video games, like girl games yeah. and the kind of games that are not, that were not popularized because they were categorized as games for girls. A lot of those games did not have like the traditional like, victory conditions a lot of them were like paper doll type games um things like animal crossing um those kind of games and and when my kid plays games on her tablet she also plays games like that and i remember like teasing my kid one day being like like hey daughter are you winning and my like kid rolls her eyes at me and she's like mom this game doesn't have winning <laughs> <laughs> and like so to me, like, I feel like this predominant, this predominant attitude that games have to have like, like a victory condition that they have to, that most of them have like a single victor. And even that there's like a single goal that you work towards to complete is a patriarchal one where problems have to be solved or somebody has to be proven as like the dominant one and, um, and that everything has to be like a contest. And then like, if we were in a flip world where we were predominantly like fandom games, they would be like games of like expression and our like artistic creation and not necessarily like stomping out each other, but just like, like collaborate, like communicating and supporting and nurturing each other. Um, again, all vibes, like gender is a construct. It's all made up. It's a uh, Calvin ball, but like that's, when I said that, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really happy to like hear and think about this, right? Like, you know, however you want to label it. Like, I think you're right that a lot of games are centered around dominance. There's a lot of games like fewer by the day, but still the dominant thing is fighting. Like I play a lot of war games, you know, pew pew. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh but yeah, I mean, so much of our even non-fighty games are really about being the best at something and mm -hmm. i get it but i also don't sometimes um yeah yeah so, it's sort of like how um they say that like if you like one of the like frustration points of like bring your problem to a man versus a woman is that a man immediately wants to solve it and like if you bring a problem to a woman sometimes they'll do the thing you actually need and just listen to you and hear you out and be there for you and to me it's like the same kind of thing like games are a puzzle that must be solved as opposed to an experience that you just like listen to and receive yes yes okay so how does that relate to i saw some tests and some images of a game that you have coming up called conviction ah uh, yes <laughs> which is about having an argument and i feel like this is the perfect time to talk about it so what uh what is the premise of conviction as a game and like could you say something about the game's possible endings. Yes. Yeah, so conviction is a game where you're having a quarrel with like your significant other, with your partner. And the game centers is uh, it's supposed to take the aesthetics of like a fairy tale, like like relationship. Um 
And the the way the game could possibly end is either with one partner dominating the other or with um, both players like separating because they can't figure out resolution or both players mean like or collaborating and cooperating and mean like a mutual resolution. And the the way the game plays that out is like it's a bit of a deck builder. Um, the cards have either your suit or your partner's suit. And the more cards of um, your partner's suit that are in your deck, the more your mind has changed to favor your partner's position. And the more cards of your own suit that are in your deck is more how much more like adamant that you are that your position is right. So if you're both able to like reach a balance in your decks where like you both change your mind about the same amount, then you could reach like this collaborative goal. But if you both don't change at all, then you go your separate ways. And then if one person managed to just like dominate the relationship, like just all most mostly their cards in their deck and their own deck, then that's a relationship where one player has gotten what they want. And I find that framing it that way, most people view the dominant the dominate ending to be a bad one. And but that's kind of what most games prime us for. <laughs> yeah. So Again, like in, in playtesting, you know, do you see people attempting to like make the relationship work? And I mean, I'm assuming that all possibilities are in play, like from the beginning of the game, that you could get any of the endings. So yeah, yeah. I guess what decisions do you make along the way that lead you to, I guess, either the breakup or compromise versus ending up dominating somebody? Is it, yeah, how do you build into that? So like... So you mean like in as a player or as like yeah. a designer? Yeah, well, both actually. Like what are you doing that gets them to do something? So like <laughs> as a player, um, I, I used to have the approach of playing where I would try to reach a mutual ending no matter what. Um, and I realized after playing some of my, some of the, some games this way that sometimes people will just take advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I've adopted the strategy of like trying to trying to suss out if the art player is also trying to cooperate with me. And then um, if they're not just work towards a separation, like, uh, like if, if I get the sense that they're like putting their, they're rejecting my cards and they're trying to take opportunities to, like make things really unbalanced, like like removing my cards from the game and like deliberately um, then refusing to hear like ref like I put cards in their deck and they immediately throw them away. Then I'm like, okay, this isn't going to work. And I try to do my set my best to be like really defensive and throw their cards back to them and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I really I really want to try this game now. Um, so if the domination ending is considered the worst ending like what is your perspective on it as a designer like in a non-hierarchical sense like do you feel that all endings are equally valid or do you have personal preferences for how the game turns out i do think that all those endings are valid because it's not like it's not like every single conflict that a relationship has is one where both parties need to be met there are there are arguably times when one person as the point like one person is does have like the better like like idea like the the framing of the game is that one player is like an idealist that wants like adventure and change and the other person is this tower that wants things like safe and like stable and like um and the game like when it starts like some of the cards are like removed from the game at the very beginning and some of the cards are like um like start in the player's hands and it's deliberately it's intentionally like unbalanced where one player will have more cards than the other no matter what one player will have like start will have a starting advantage and to me like there's some situations where like the, the fiction of the game is that one person has a point and the other person is being stubborn and not like hearing that at all <laughs> 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 um and like so I guess, um, like, yeah, there are times where I could imagine the dominant ending being like the, the like 
so and so better one. Um, yeah. What about your playtesters? Like, did they seem to work for particular endings outside of gameplay, like for ideological reasons, or um, do they just Most... kind of get into the play somehow and something different happens? A, a lot of the times, I see a similar thing where people read over it and they think. Well, I've seen like a couple things happen. One is where like people read over the rules and then they're like, so we're working for a mutual cooperative ending, right? And their person's like, right, right, right. And then they kind of play it more like a puzzle than like a, like a actual conflict where they're like, okay, I I handed you this many cards. Okay, I think you need to hand me more of these cards. And that, that's why I had to add a rule that you can't talk about numbers because that was like breaking like the <laughs> fiction of the game. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then another thing that might happen is like one player is like, so we're working towards a cooperative game, right? And the other person's like, uh -huh, let's let's see how it plays out. And then they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So you mentioned before, right, that you get people kind of bring a bit of themselves to your games, or at least they bring their presuppositions about what a game is supposed to be like. They might read competition in where it isn't there, or they might read mm -hmm. cooperation in, but there's actually some pretty spicy stuff that can happen. Do you think that... Ooh, how do I ask this? I guess the question is, so do you think that your games bring something out of people that happens specifically in game space, like they feel uninhibited? Or do you think that your games get people to tell more of the truth about themselves than they might have intended? I think a little of both. Um... I think because I've definitely seen people who are playing them and they're like, and they actually say like, normally I would be hyper competitive and I would screw over another person this, but because we could both win, I find myself wanting to not do that, like optimal screw you over move. And I think that's really cool and liberating. That's, that's what I want to see. I want to see more people think like, think this is my normal programming, but what if I did that instead? <laughs> But at the same time, I've had lots of experiences playing my games where I'm like, um, and also like other people's multi-victor games where I'm like, oh my God, like I have like these really self-destructive people-pleasing tendencies and I need to stop. And it's like, that's not a thing I could explore in a single victor game where I'm like, where the game is just like, you want to get the most, okay? But like, um, like they, I was playing, play testing David Masanao's game, um, like, um, he took his game roommates and is turning it into this multi-victor like game spell week. And like I had this experience of like doing everything to help like all the other players like with their household chores and trying to uplift them and them not reciprocating at all. And like <laughs> and like at the end I was like, I'm like actually mad. Why am I actually mad? <laughs> I don't know. I within games, I actually do get like a little bit heated. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I usually don't get heated. Like, like maybe I'll joke, like, "Oh, I rolled like like five zeros in a row. I'm incredibly upset." Like, but like, but like, uh, it's like what a game, whatever. But like, for some reason, I got really emotional in that game. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, no, I'm emotional in all my games. Like I forget immediately after, if that makes sense. Like all is mm -hmm. forgiven once the game is over, but like within the game, I'm heated up. <laughs> so I feel like I feel like you could have chosen a lot of art forms to express kind of ambiguity and nuance. Like I feel like when I want to most of my artistic experiences of nuanced or ambiguous things or like people having like kind of varied viewpoints on something come from like a novel or from from a painting so mm -hmm. what is it about games that makes this the best venue for you to kind of express and also like bring these like different reactions out of people well like i well, like at first, I th I was like drawn towards like video games because like to me, video games was like the ultimate medium. Like it's like the audio, the visual, like the interactive. Like it's like you could be so fully immersed in it. Like, but I found myself like really enjoying the tabletop space because it kind of allows me to focus on the social aspect. Like, 
I feel like more than video games, then like it allows me to center the social aspect because like <clears throat> you could bring like a board game to somebody and you could even forget like the mechanical structure of it and just be like, um, we're going to make Park Place give you money, right? Like, <laughs> like you could decide to break the rules of it and establish a new social construct on top of that. And I think that's really fascinating. And sometimes I try to make games that try to push the players to do that. And um, I think that's like such a fascinating like space to play in. It's like the art of like like social interactions and agency and how people interact with each other. Um, I feel like games more than any other medium um, play in that space and tabletop games especially. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it. And then if somebody was like going to play all of your games, I feel so the way that people play games, I do think is revealing about them in some way. But kind of I'm starting to feel like now that I make games myself and really play people's games even more intensively than I did when I was a reviewer, I think you learn things about designers by playing their games. So if somebody were to look at your work and draw conclusions about you, what do you think that you're telling us about yourself in your work? Uh. You know, this was like a question that uh, break my game discord like yesterday and I gave the joke answer that like I'm a very submissive and infertile person, uh, but I think. <laughs> 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 but like, uh, but joking aside, like um, most of my games are about like being like intentionally vulnerable. Um, so I don't know, maybe somebody might look at them, like look at my games and be like, this is a person that wants to like that wants to help people like potentially at the cost of themselves. I don't know, or, or wants to play in a space where that is a point of expression. I don't know. Yeah. I also, I find it very, very interesting that you really enjoy subverting mechanical expectations. So like, I feel like the world of gaming is a world where you play a certain kind of game and you expect something from it. Like people expect brutal competition depending on the mechanisms that you give them right mm -hmm. um so do you think that that is part of the appeal of games for you specifically like you like rule sets that you can then subvert or you can bring something unexpected out of uh like almost like a cultural system for which there are expectations yeah yeah i definitely i definitely enjoy looking at how those things can be subverted um, I sometimes worry that I like enjoy it a little too much because like um, eventually if you do that enough, then I don't know, like when I watched like the Muppet show as a kid and they like break the fourth wall so many times after a while, it's sort of like, well, this is just the show, right? Like it's just always like breaking. <laughs> there is no fourth wall anymore. They've done it so many times that it's just expected. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, so like I do worry that like perhaps I... I, I think about even that aspect of it because like, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a thing that I think about a lot. <laughs> I mean, like if you get a surprise birthday party every year, is it really a surprise kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. And I even <laughs> joked about it in like the um, the thing that I, um, like uh, when The Lost of Rapture got published with Holland Spiel, maybe that's the game I should have mentioned at the very beginning because that one's actually published. <laughs> <laughs> But like when um Amabel asked me to send some videos for the promotion of that, um I made a I made a skit where like I was talking about the game being subversive and then um the ca camera switching to like another view of me recording that saying like ah oh, it's not subversive if you say it's subversive. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's awesome. So actually tell you what, take a moment to plug Velocirapture since we're here. Okay. And then yeah, a couple more questions. Um, and then some softies. <laughs> well, yeah, Velocirapture is a game where you're playing as uh, dinosaurs playing human games until the apocalypse. And it's really a game about the wrong uh, slash right way to play games because that's a game with no victory conditions. It has like motivations that you give to the players of what they're the ways they cope during the their last few minutes on the planet and all those ways kind are ways that they engage with the game is some players want to cheat some players want to win some players want to help others win and um and i tried to make it so that's the 
there's a good mix of some that would want to take the game seriously and some that would want to disrupt them. And so the tension is in how those players interact. Uh, the players who want to play seriously and the ones that want to disrupt things. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that's a very silly, silly game. <laughs> On Doomsday, which dinosaur are you? Are you the play um, seriously or are you the disrupt everything? I I I think that I'm the um I'm the there's one that's just a throwaway that's just like play games with your friends. That's like <laughs> you could do literally anything. And I feel like I'm that dinosaur sometimes. It's just like whatever, sure, we could we could play like you rolled a three instead of a zero. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, speaking of games, what are some games that have delighted and maybe even surprised you recently? Um, can I talk about like the games that are not like games I've play tested? <laughs> uh, yeah, as long as the designer wouldn't care, I'm here for it. Okay. Um, I uh, uh, Maya Tom uh, Thomas had like made this game, this cursed VHS game, where like like some teenagers are making a summoning circle to like get their souls out of a cursed VHS and um and like that like she made that game like and then on a whim brought it to protospiel and like in the very first playtest I was like oh this game is already really good <laughs> like <laughs> like um and she's just made it even like better over time. I that one like really caught me by surprise. Like because like normally like the first play test, you're kind of like like I, I enjoyed like the very early play tests because there's so much potential and things that are so wacky and but like from the get-go that game had like has like so much in potential and it was already like a great experience. So like um yeah, that was surprising because usually there's like there's a lot of like sloppy stuff in there, but that one was already great. So that surprised me. Um, uh, and then, yeah, uh, and, and delighted. Um, uh, uh, Milda, uh, Milda Matilda's game, uh, Milda Matilda's game, uh, Pax Penning, uh, like it really delights me. That's a game that I wish I could get to the table more often. That one's also a multi-victor game, actually. That one's a published multi-victor game. And it's great. Um, I really like the way that she handled like the um the coalitions in that game. Yeah. Awesome. And then you mentioned that for you, like the ultimate first dream of high art was to make a video game. So if you're gonna play a video game and have what you would consider to be like an artistically life-changing experience, what video game would that be? Um, like a uh, one that exists that's higher yeah. to me um like one of my favorites is copy papers please uh that game like uh lucas pope's like work is just like very inspiring like to me um so yeah i would say papers please fantastic and if people want to follow your work online where can you be found uh you can find me at knifebunny.com that's where i link all the other social medias that i'm on like discord and blue sky and youtube which is where i'm probably most active out of those well no discord is where i'm most active then youtube was where i give all my updates <laughs> fantastic uh zoe thank you so much for coming on this has been a really fun conversation and i'm just really looking forward to more of your work yeah thank you so much for talking with me this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody out there if you want to find me online i'm terminally online i'm beyond solitaire everywhere uh and please like subscribe comment ask questions and most of all happy gaming